accept my seat. Oh, Lord, get on another hand. Come on. Give me a seat for a moment. Does anybody have an urgent prayer request? They want to just uh, read it. Tell us about you. Got one? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Wayne, you take us to the throne, brother. That's all right. Our Father God is a privilege to be able to come up here this morning, Father. Thank you for the Son, he sat down upon us to say, Father, we just thank you for gathering here today, Lord. Father, thank you for the word we receive. Father, now we're ready for you. So we pray from our mouths from our hearts, Father. We know what they need, Father. We know the kind of touch that we need, Father. And we're entrusting that you will put that touch upon them today, Father. Give all of us our sin, Father, our demons and small and more of us. We try to be pure in the heart, Father. Now, Father, be with us to open our minds and hearts to accept the word. This and all things I continue to ask in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Yes, I just say amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. It got so good. Oh, amen. Come on, I dare somebody to go ahead and give the glory out there. Come on. Glory. Glory. Say amen. We're going to have some fun today. All right. Ready to stand back up. I saw my hair in the mirror this morning. I thought about that song. I'll fly away. <laughs> Y'all ready? We just, we just just jump in and start singing the it is.
had children would get out of hand. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I saw, I, I read this about a guy, and it was so good. We ought to skip. It should be for Father's Day, but Father's Day is next week. But this is a pre Father's Day awesome thought. All right? A couple with three children waited in line at San Francisco's Pier 41 to purchase tickets for a boat trip to Alcatraz. Y'all know what Alcatraz is. The prison, nobody should be able to escape from except, except for Clint Eastwood, nobody else escaped from <laughs> Others watched with varying degrees of sympathy and irritation as the young children fidgeted, whined, punched one another. The frazzled parents from, uh, from, uh, reprimanded them to no avail. Finally, they reached the ticket window. Five tickets, please, the father said. Two round trip and three one way. <laughs> Kids finally calm down. <laughs> God, God is so, so, so awesome. I'm not going to preach. I'm just going to kind of just a, 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 a little thing to get us through because this is going to finish up after Father's Day. This started last week. But I give everybody an assignment. And that's what to see if you've been doing your assignment. So, so again, uh, just do it. This was last week's assignment, and it's so simple. It's so simple that, that you can that you can follow all you know, There's some folks who couldn't even, couldn't even uh, uh, fall on the ground. They missed the ground and fell over. And then, guess what? This is so so simple. And here it was, so simple. And whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in dependence upon. His person giving praise to God the Father through Him. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Amen? So, I'm just going to ask, do I have to raise your hands? No testimonies? That's what no. Because last week I said, I promise you if you do this, your week will change radically. So let me ask you a question. Did your week radically change physically, mentally, spiritually? Because I promise you, your job situation will change. Your, your family situation will change. Your, your church situation will change if you can learn to follow this. Matter of fact, I, I, I want to just go just a little bit further and then, then the, the Honorable John Solomon is coming up here. Amen. Here he goes. Just another way of putting this here. Uh, Colossians. And while so you do the word that you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And there's three words. Just three words. The first word is words. It's where we get the word logos, but it's the way on back. Lego, where we get the word logos. Lego is not building blocks, although it does build in your language. Amen. It's something that is said, but not only something. How many have ever, how many ever been anybody that had this disease, uh, diarrhea of the mouth, constipation of the brain? <laughs> Amen? They just run their mouth hold and on and on and on. And finally they think of what they say. Like, oh man, did I say that? Okay. This here, this word means something not only that is said, but it's something that is thought through. Reasoning. I think before I open my mouth. So whatever I do, a word or deed, a thoughtful word or deed, something that I know that is going to make a difference and I'm going to try to keep it together. Word or deed. And that word deed uh, air goes where we get the word energy. It's back to the basic room where we get the word energy, which means to work, to toil. And it, even as an effort or an occupation. So that's even on your work. At your work. Even how many, don't, don't raise any hands, but how many don't necessarily like the kind of job they're doing? Don't necessarily like the kind of job they're doing right now. Do you know how to get a promotion? Work your way out of your job. Work your way up. You start doing your job like you should and keep on going, you're going to go up. Amen? And if you don't go up, at least you'll spread out. God's going to bless it. So, whatever you do, think about it through your mouth. Whatever you do, whether it's at home or at work or around others, you do and do this uh, in the name. The most powerful name in the world is Jesus. Amen? And so in His name, in His authority, by His character. And if you do that, Something special. Well, Sam, yeah. How many times do you just say, just do something, please? 
There's a lot of books that just sit there and wait till the right moment, wait till the right time. And the kids, yes, she says, if that's how you're going to do it, then you're not going to do anything. Amen. The part of it for the most perfect time uh, to, to, to plant his coin. He tries to use wisdom, but he knows sometimes he's just got to get it done. When he goes to Arkansas, sometimes he's just got to get it done. I left here a couple of Tuesday nights ago, and I left here like 10.30 at night on a Tuesday night. I've been counseling. I left here 10.30, almost 11 o'clock, and as I'm riding down the Hodges stretch, there was, there was farmers out there in the field with their lights on. Wow. Taking care of business. Wow. Amen? Amen. That's very powerful. Amen? So, so, so again, do something. Here it is. This is it. New Living Translation, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, to God the Father. Amen? Whatever you do. And talk about whatever you do, and what, where you go, uh, the Honorable Johnson, Johnson, Honorable Johnson Ribblesong is coming up here. Come on up, bro. Give me the one with the kimono. That is not a house coat, that's a kimono. Give Lord a hand for this young man. All right. Um, so there's a lot of new faces in here that I have not seen before. I'm John. I spent. Well, say so you don't need to get some new set to hear you. No matter how loud you are, I can't hear you. Don't tear my ear off. Chris <laughs> is a little bigger than that. We'll, we'll talk after church. <laughs> um, so I spent two and a half months in Japan in the town called Inkomo, which is right in the mountains outside of Osaka for those who are new and don't know me. Um, it was a work missions trip that fell into my lap that is probably going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'll go back for a week. My wife's not going to let me go for two and a half months again. Um, that was a very long conversation I had to have with her. But my time in Japan, while it was all work and there wasn't a whole lot of evangelism on my part, I was there to allow the missionaries that were there for the evangelism to go back and do the evangelism. You know, when there's work to be done, there's work to be done. And it takes away from their main job of being able to reach out into the community. So I was there to help alleviate them having to do the manual labor. So while I was in Japan, though, one of the biggest things that people kept asking me from back home, my friends that had encouraged me to do this trip were asking me, you know, what's it like? How is it everything going? And they would constantly text me as I was trying to go to sleep and as they were waking up, and I wouldn't respond until they were going to sleep and I was waking up. Japan is 13 hours ahead. Um, getting over there was rough because jet lag, I, I thought I was young enough to handle it. And I, oh, I'm not going to need to sleep. I slept pretty much all day. The first day that I got there, I spent 10 minutes trying to think that I could work. My body said no. Same thing when I came back. It was basically 24 hours of flying time there and back. If you've ever been on a plane and you watch the sun set and then rise again, it's a very weird, weird time to see that, but such is life. But as I was there for two and a half months, I had a lot of time to think and reflect not only on myself, but what God, you know, wants for us in life. And I was struggling to find a verse that could really fit and summarize my time there. It was a beautiful place. I mean, you see the pictures, you see everything that happens there. Japan is beautiful. They take a lot of time to maintain their culture, the buildings, the heritage that they have. Most of it is all made from wood. So if you see pictures of things that look like metal, it's all wood, which is a very weird concept to think that their buildings are being held together by wooden nails. And then you walk up to the fifth story of that building and you think you're going to fall through it because it's over 300 years old. I would not recommend it for bigger people like myself. It was a very scary experience. Um, but during my time there, I was able to detox. I know that's a weird word to use in this 
uh, talking point, but I was able to detox from the issues that were going on in America. My news on my phone wasn't filled with what was happening in our country. I was able to get away from it all. And in getting away from it all, you're able to look back and you're able to reflect on what's going on. And you look back at America and the rest of the world sees America as a broken country. People see the infighting that's happened. They see all the issues that they have. And the world is judging us as a nation. People are laughing at us. People are saying that, you know, we've lost our minds. And as an American in Japan, I will say that there is still racism alive and well in Japan. There were many times that I was on a train and older folks that were on that train would get on, they'd see me, and then walk to a different train car. Would say nothing to me. You could just tell by the look in their eyes. They didn't want anything to do with me, so they would just walk to a different car and avoid me altogether. And you know, one of the biggest things that people told me as I was doing research and online, everybody says, no, Japan's a not so place to go. People are so friendly and they're so kind. That's not exactly true. If their job isn't a tourist job or they're required to talk to people every day, then they're not going to talk to you. They're going to ignore you. They're going to keep their heads down and just go about their day. And in understanding that, Japan is a very depressive society. You go to work and you go home and your room is a little 8x8 eight eight room. That's all you've got sometimes. And you go to work, you go home. You go to work, you go home. And that's all you do every day. So while Japan puts on this image of being almost perfect and everybody's happy and they're welcoming, that's the layer that they want you to see. And as Christians, sometimes that's how we act, is we put on this idea of perfection, and we want people to see that we're doing okay, we're deep down inside, we're struggling and we're broken. Japan has the highest suicide rate in the world among men and women, because all they do is work. There is not a whole lot of free time, there is no time to socialize with friends. Your average 9 to 5 job that you think, oh, they're working in an office, they get off at 5 o'clock every day. It's an unspoken mandatory overtime that if you're not leaving, you know, three or four hours after the workday ends, then you're not doing things right. They hold a big emphasis on family and traditional values. The predominant religion in Japan is Buddhism, but none of them practice it. They just keep doing it because their family's done it for generations. At the top of the mountain where I was staying at is one of the oldest shrines in Japan. People from all over would come and pay homage to the shrine. And you would watch the cars drive up and down the mountain, or you would watch people walk up and down the mountain. But they were just doing it because that's what society told them they had to do. And in seeing all this, I look back and I see a broken church in America. We have so many issues wrong with ourselves not just as individuals, but a church as a whole, that there are things that we should probably be working on inside and outside. And it made me realize that there's a perfect couple of verses, not just one single verse, but there's a couple of verses that perfectly describe how the church can fix it, because acknowledging the problem allows you to fix it. If you don't ever acknowledge that there's a problem with you, you're going to spend the rest of your life just living in blissful ignorance. Everything's fine. Everything's okay. And more power to you if you can live like that, but I know most of us can't. So the verses that came to mind, if you have your Bibles, turn there. Matthew 7, 1 through 6, and I'll read it out loud in case you don't have your Bibles, or you can read it on the screen if you can see the writing. And of course, in Matthew, lays out everything pretty well organized when Jesus is talking to people. And it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you 
see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, John, what does that have to do with mission trips to Japan? Like I said, I didn't do much of the evangelism. I talked to people, locals that would come out and ask us what we were about and things of that nature. And we would talk through broken English and a translator most of the time because as much as I tried, I couldn't learn Japanese to save my life. I know three words. That's how to say excuse me, hello, and thank you. That's excuse me is simise. Of course, hello is konnichiwa. That's a pretty simple one to, to learn. And then thank you is arigato. I don't know how to roll my R's. And they have a lot of R sounds in their language. So it was very difficult to communicate sometimes. But as I was there and I was able to work. And if you've ever done physical labor. And you do it five days a week. There's a lot of time where you just get to sit there and reflect. As you're hammering nails or you're painting. Or you're doing just some menial task. There's hours upon hours where you just get to sit and reflect. As you're thinking why am I doing this? What really made me come out here and do this? And that's what I was able to do. And then I go in the evenings and I'm reading my Bible and I'm looking at pictures of home or I'm on social media and because I'm using Japanese internet, their news is what I'm seeing. And I'm looking and I'm seeing America through their eyes and I see how much they judge us because of how broken we are. And Pastor David brought it up before I left. He was encouraging me, but he was also being a realist with me about, you know, there's a lot of issues here, you know, so when you go, it may not be all sunshine and rainbows while you're there in Japan, but remember that there's issues in our own backyard that we have to deal with. And that stuck out to me as I was there. And that those verses come to mind because for us, we as Americans, judge the rest of the world a lot of times. And you may not want to admit that you judge the world, but you do. Deep down you do. I do. I did. Biggest lie that was told to me before I went to Japan, everybody speaks English. No, they don't. <laughs> nope. Again, if their job is not tourist related, they don't speak it. And even, even though they're practicing it and learning it in school because their parents are making them to, nope. No. Nope. They don't speak it. There were many times that I would sit there and look at somebody who was talking to me in fluent Japanese. Huh? What? I, I have no idea what they were saying. You know, my phone would translate, but only go so far sometimes. Most of the time, I translate it and then I point that this is what I want. And nine times out of ten, it was wrong when they brought it to me. But, you know, you live with what you get sometimes. So. I say all that to say this, is that we cannot be hypocrites in judging other nations. Japan is a nation that is so ripe for missions opportunity. Before I left, I told you the this, this statistics of what it was like to be a missionary over there. For every 16,000 people, there's one missionary. And that number is just what they said, and then when I was over there and I met the missionaries and I got to talk to people, it's way worse. They need way more help. The church that I was attending over there was an international church. That pastor had been doing it for almost 30 years. He turned 65 while I was over there, and I joked with him. I said, well, that's retirement age. What are you going to do? Keep working. And he hinted at, oh, well, maybe you should come over and take my position. I mentioned that to my wife. If you've ever heard a sterner no, please let me know because she, she put her foot down harder than it's ever been put down before and told me no. But I, the missionaries and the people that have been there helping to build the church and to spread Jesus' word in Japan, they're retiring, they're getting old, they can't do it anymore. The same goes for America. You look at the churches today. Pastors are aging out. Nobody wants to take over these jobs because they're difficult. They're mentally taxing to handle this world that we're in. So don't be a hypocrite and judge another nation for their lack of Christianity 
when here in America, Christianity is struggling just as much or even more. You know, they have that blissful ignorance that I was talking about because half of them have never even heard of Jesus. Whereas we have four churches on the same city block sometimes, so we have no excuse for knowing who Jesus is. We don't have an excuse for not being willing to go out into the community and help those in need and encourage them to come to church and to know Christ. So that's the big talk about it. Let me introduce you to the team that I was with. So that gentleman sitting on the couch with the do-rag, his name is Darren. Darren is from Canada. He's lived in Japan for over 30 years as a carpenter. He's not saved. We spent many, many hours through our time working, talking. Whether I had an impact on him, I don't know. Maybe he'll get saved, maybe he won't. But we spent many hours discussing the Bible and talking about what it meant to be a Christian because under the Buddhist ideology, you know, there is not a real moral code. You're being good for goodness sakes. And then at the end of the day, that leaves you feeling empty. Whereas a Christian, we're good because Jesus calls us to be good. And we have that fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. So there was a lot of talks of comparing Buddhism to Christianity. And how Buddhism, the ultimate goal is nirvana, to leave yourself feeling empty and nothingness. As a Christian, that's baffling because we don't want to feel nothingness. We want to feel Jesus' embrace every day that we wake up. The younger guy with glasses, his name is Eleazar. He was from California. He had been living there for two years doing English teaching and music ministry. He is an amazing, amazing singer. Better than I will ever be by a landslide. He had spent two years with him, and he only spent a month with us because he was moving on to a different company in Japan to build guitars, to expand his music ministry. When you have that gift of music, it's very hard to find avenues for it that just aren't associated with church, but he was going into the workforce. He was building guitars and sharing his love of Jesus through music. The gentleman on the end with his eyes closed enjoying the food is... Gary, he was from Seattle. He had only been saved three months before he came to Japan for two weeks. He got saved, somebody had told him about missions, and he decided to come for two weeks. And then, of course, there's me. But y'all already know me. So, let's see. How? So, the work was physically demanding for four people. And at the, the last month, it was just me and Darren. So when you have two people, that requires a lot of work. It was very taxing. We spent the first month just tearing off old siding and putting up new siding. For those of you who work with siding, it was all old and rotted. And there was tar paper underneath. It was a gross job. Your fingers were sticky. You were smelly every day. And then we put up a concrete particle board. This... Right here, it's probably the most difficult deck I've ever put up. If you notice underneath the ground, ran at an angle. So we had to sit there and spend hours cutting the right angle, making sure that it would stay when we put weight on it to put this deck up. We had to reattach all of the AC units. They don't have central heating and air over there. Every room has its own personal heater and AC, which sounds like a great concept because you can change the temperature to whatever you want it to until you got to go outside on the third floor and move that compressor on and off siding. And I'm a big guy, right? That siding is for Japanese people, not American people. And I am not as young as I once was, and I know some of y'all are looking at me, oh, you're still young, I'll be 28 in July, but my knees felt like I was 60 some days, climbing up and down all of this scaffolding. It was a fun time. We put up awning, this is the finished product of this side. The plastic awning on the top will go on in September when the next team comes in and the scaffolding hangs down. But as you can see, it angles downward because we're on the side of a mountain with a lot of stuff. So again, looks can be deceiving because when you're at the third floor of that scaffolding, 
you see the entire town of Ecoma. That's really trippy because you don't feel really high up and then you look out and you know you're really high up on the mountain. We put up fencing. There's a sheer drop on the other side and Japan Mission has um, a daycare that comes every couple of days and there were preschoolers so we had we ended up having to put up new fencing all around because it had rusted out the moms you know even though you tell your kid not to do something they're still going to do it don't go to the edge they're going to go look just natural curiosity so we had to put up fencing everywhere that was done we had a playground area with things that needed to be re-varnished and repainted just a lot of physically demanding work. And again, this is that time that I was talking about where I was able to reflect. It was quiet. It was peaceful. Even though the city was right down the mountainside, the only thing you ever heard was the occasional siren <coughs> from an ambulance. And it was peaceful and it was serene and knowing that I didn't have to go everywhere and look over my shoulder and check and make sure somebody wasn't going to rob me. It was nice. This is the finished product. We painted the fence. We refarnished the deck. And eventually that stuff will need to be replaced, but not for a long time now. This is the area where the kids would come and play and be a part of the community. I thought this was neat. This is just a neat picture right here. As we were taking all the scrap metal out, you know, when you go to a scrap yard, normally you've got to dump it all by hand yourself. They're very efficient. They use magnets. I don't know why we can't use magnets at our scrap yards, but those trucks, the little K trucks, I'm a big dude, and I still fit on them, so that was quite nice. So, every Saturday, Japan Mission held a little cafe for the community. It was an opportunity for people in the community to come enjoy a cup of coffee. They could practice their English. They could talk. The kids could play. The lady sitting right there, her name is Belinda. She is from South Africa. She came to Japan to speak English and to explore the world. That's one of our locals. His name was Mr. Miori. His English was actually really well because he spent a number of years living in California running his own business before he moved back home. So just a really neat opportunity to be able to talk with people. You know, you find different ways to reach out to the community. You don't just have to say, come to church this day, or come to church that day, or we have a church event. Sometimes you have to go to where the people are. More pictures. That's kind of the siding that we were putting up. We used a concrete particle board that's supposed to last for 30 to 40 years. We'll see if that actually is true. Hopefully, I don't have to go back in 30 years and redo all the work that I did because that would be interesting. Just some more pictures of the work. So, again, as we opened things up to the community and people were coming, the kids, Japan holds a huge amount of respect and importance for kids. There's holidays for the kids where all they do is celebrate the kids. Now, the kids are listening and you're probably thinking that's really great, but then you think about it and your parents are going to put a lot on you to do that day. You've got to look presentable. You've got to get dressed up and nice. But with the daycare that was there, it allowed the moms to come in and the kids would be able to play with each other while we talked to the moms about being Christians and what it meant to raise your children in a Christian household. And most of the parents that came were saved. There were a few that were still trying to understand it, what it meant to be a Christian. And it's important to understand that mom that's right there had just recently converted to being a Christian. And this is where it gets kind of sad because the rest of her family cut her off. It's important to understand that family values and family traditions and connections in Japan is everything. If your grandfather did it, your dad did it, and now you're going to do it. And so on and so forth through the generations. When you go against what the family wants in Japan, you're cut off. There is no contact with the family. The family ignores you. They shut you out from things. Because she became Christian, she missed her own mother's funeral. And the family wouldn't talk to her. 
So I spent I spent time talking with her and, and telling her, you know, just because that's what your family wants doesn't mean that's what God wants. Look at Jesus' time. Even his own family didn't believe who he was. So if his own family didn't believe who he was, your family's not always going to understand the decision to become a Christian. But even though she was cut off from her blood family, she found a new family in Christ through other Christians, and she sees the joy that comes with being around other Christians and like-mindedness. The kids have fun when they're together. So there, while there was sorrow in not being with her family, she still found joy in having a new family. More pictures of a cafe. Let's see. This, uh, this is L on the last night that he was with us. He put together a little concert to sing for people before he left. There were a lot of tears from the locals who had come to know and love him over the two and a half years that he was there because he moved to Tokyo. Which, on an island the size of Japan, you're thinking Tokyo is right down the road. Tokyo is a 10 hour trip if you're lucky, depending on traffic. So that's like going from the coast of North Carolina to the mountains. It's not a short trip by any stretch of the imagination. You know I mean, you could spend the $300 to take the bullet train if you wanted to, but then who wants to spend $300 on a train ticket? I didn't, that's for sure. This is one of the best pictures that I could find because Mount Ekoma is such a steep mountain. There were many sections where you could stand and look out over the city. And this stairwell that I'm on went all the way down to the train station and goes all the way up to the mountain where the temple is at. And people walk this. I attempted and I got halfway and I said no more. But I was at the middle of the mountain, so I could go either up or down, which made it quite nice most of the time. I didn't have to walk the full mountain. But could you imagine a couple hundred years ago the people having to walk all the way up that mountain and then all the way back down? And of course, there are many other buildings in this area that line the road to the temple that people would stop at, shops and stalls that you could buy things and trade with and so on and so forth. But now that there's a road, the inside of this town is dead because nobody has to walk those streets anymore. Nobody goes into those buildings. Half of these houses, the only reason they're maintained is because the city says you have to maintain it. It's a historical district. This is the stairwell at night. It leads up to the temple. I liked it better at night because all the lanterns were on and it looked really peaceful to walk up there. And I had many people tell me, oh, as a Christian, why are you going to the temple? I simply went for the architect to see what it was like. And it was beautiful, it was peaceful, and it was quiet at night. Nobody was there. The temple's open 24-7 for people to go and explore and to pray and to worship there. But I was able to walk through at night and see all of the different images that they had in there and the different statues of Buddha and so on and so forth. But I'll leave you with this as I, as I close, that even though there's a surface level of beauty to Japan and everything on the top looks exquisite, the food was immaculate, the people in the tourist areas were very nice and kind, you peel back that layer, and that's what I did I went to the poor areas. I went into the areas where people said, no, don't go there because, you know, there's some sketchy people there. That's exactly where Jesus wants us. To go to those places where the people aren't being reached the most. Paul was there. Paul was with the worst of them at times when he was in prison. So why is it that Paul and the apostles are willing to go be with the worst of them, but we're scared to even glance at somebody who looks a little different than us. And it goes again, it goes back to what Matthew wrote down what Jesus said about not judging others just because of their appearance. And I'm guilty of it too. 
Every day I'm guilty of it because there's plenty of people I judge. I see what you post on Facebook sometimes and I sit there and I question, is that really the right thing to post? You know, you judge people sometimes on their bad jokes. <laughs>
see what's going on there, and on the outside, you're going, I don't want to be in that. There's no way, but once you get in there, you find out that you're bringing God with you, and when you're bringing God with you, you can be bold. But why, why do we do this? Like you said, why do we go out to the highways and the hedges? Why do we go all over the place? I'm just reading a few scriptures, and, uh, and then we're going to pray. Matthew 25 and 36, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Hebrews 13 and 3, remember those who are in prison and those uh, as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated <coughs> since you also are also in the body. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Isaiah 61 and 1 says, and this is just a confirmation, uh, Luke's confirmation of this, the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to, the, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison of those who are bound. One more scripture. Matthew 25, 35, and 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, or clothed thee? Or we, we have saw thee sick or in prison or came unto thee. And the king answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Wow. It is so important. That was awesome, John. Very awesome. You know, judge the book by its cover. We judge books by the cover every day. And ask God to open your eyes. You know, not always have good to Japan. You know, we don't always get the opportunity, but we all get the opportunity every day for God to open our eyes. And we all get the opportunity every day. God will send people to you, and sometimes it's very uncomfortable. Uh, I've had some people lately that honestly it was very, very, very uncomfortable, and sometimes I had to, uh, I knew I had to be on guard as I was helping these people, but at the same time, <clears throat> I was thinking about that. I was a hungry, and you took me. I was hurting. I was destitute, and you took care of me. We're, so think about this. Is sometimes when you're entertaining strangers, you're entertaining angels nowhere. Amen? God's called us. Japan. Edward. Washington. Newburgh. Tell him, 
kept telling him, tell her I love her. So he, he said, I'll come back after the service when I got more time and I'll talk to her. So he went to the service and as he's coming back, walking down, walking down the sidewalk, there's EMS at the restaurant. He walks in and he finds out that girl had committed suicide. And she left a note that said, nobody loves me. Get out. Do something. If you want to go to Japan, go to Japan. John will tell you how to get there. <laughs> but I also dare you. I also dare you not just to go to Japan. And I'll commend John for what he did very, very much. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. 